An American Tragedy. Novel by Theodore Dreiser. Chapter 16. The result of all this, however, was that it was finally decided that perhaps the easiest and safest defense that could be made, assuming that the Griffiths family of Lycurgus would submit to it, would be that of insanity or brainstorm. A temporary aberration due to love and an illusion of grandeur aroused in Clyde by Sandra Finchley and the threatened disruption by Roberta of all his dreams and plans. But after consultation with Catchelman and Dara Brookhart at Lycurgus, and these in turn conferring with Samuel and Gilbert Griffiths, it was determined that this would not do. For to establish insanity or brainstorm would require previous evidence or testimony to the effect that Clyde was of none too sound mind, erratic his whole life long and with certain specific instances tending to demonstrate how really peculiar he was. Relatives, among them the Griffiths of Lycurgus themselves, perhaps, coming on to swear to it. A line of evidence, which, requiring as it would, outright lying and perjury on the part of many as well as reflecting on the Griffiths' blood and brain, was sufficient to alienate both Samuel and Gilbert to the extent that they would have none of it. And so Brookhart was compelled to assure Belknap that this line of defense would have to be abandoned. Such being the case, both Belknap and Jepson were once more compelled to sit down and consider. For any other defense which either could think of now seemed positively hopeless. I want to tell you one thing, observed the sturdy Jepson, after thumbing through the letters of both Roberta and Sandra again. These letters of this Alden girl are the toughest things we're going to have to face. They're likely to make any jury cry if they're read right, and then to introduce those letters from that other girl on top of these would be fatal. It will be better. I think, if we do not mention hers at all, unless he does. It will only make it look as though he had killed that Alden girl to get rid of her. Mason couldn't want anything better, as I see it. And with this Belknap agreed most heartily. At the same time, some plan must be devised immediately. And so, out of these various conferences, it was finally deduced by Jefferson, who saw a great opportunity for himself in this matter, that the safest possible defense that could be made and one to which Clyde's own suspicious and most peculiar actions would most exactly fit, would be that he had never contemplated murder. On the contrary, being a moral if not a physical coward, as his own story seemed to suggest, and in terror of being exposed and driven out of Lycurgus and of the heart of Sandra, and never as yet having told Roberta of Sandra and thinking that knowledge of this great love for her, Sandra, might influence Roberta to wish to be rid of him. He had hastily and without any worse plan in mind, decided to persuade Roberta to accompany him to any nearby resort but not especially Grass Lake or Big Bittern, in order to tell her all this and so win his freedom. Yet not without offering to pay her expenses as nearly as he could during her very trying period. All well and good, commented Belknap. But that involves his refusing to marry her, doesn't it? And what jury is going to sympathize with him for that or believe that he didn't want to kill her? Wait a minute, wait a minute, replied Jefferson, a little testily. So far it does. Sure. But you haven't heard me to the end yet. I said I had a plan. All right, then what is it? Replied Belknap most interested. Well, I'll tell you, my plan's this, to leave all the facts just as they are, and just as he tells them, and just as Mason has discussed them so far, except, of course, his striking her, and then explain them, the letters, the wounds, the bag, the two hats, everything, not deny them in any way. And here he paused and ran his long, thin, freckled hands eagerly through his light hair and looked across the grass of the public square to the jail where Clyde was. Then toward Belknap again. All very good, but how? queried Belknap. There's no other way, I tell you, went on Jepson quite to himself, and ignoring his senior, and I think this will do it. He turned to look out the window again. And began as though talking to someone outside. He goes up there, you see because he's frightened and because he has to do something or be exposed. And he signs those registers just as he did because he's afraid to have it known by anybody down there in Lycurgus that he is up there. And he has this plan about confessing to her about this other girl. But, and now he paused and looked fixedly at Belknap, and this is the keystone of the whole thing. If this won't hold water, then down we go. Listen. He goes up there with her, frightened, and not to marry her or to kill her but to argue with her to go away. But once up there and he sees how sick she is, and tired, and sad. Well, you know how much she still loves him, and he spends two nights with her, see? 
Yes, I see, interrupted Belknap, curiously, but not quite so dubiously now. And that might explain those nights. Might? What? replied Jeffson, slyly and calmly, his harebell eyes showing only cold, eager, practical logic, no trace of emotion or even sympathy of any kind, really. Well, while he's up there with her under those conditions, so close to her again, you see, and his facial expression never altered so much as by a line. He experiences a change of heart. You get me? He's sorry for her. He's ashamed of himself, his sin against her. That ought to appeal to these fellows around here, these religious and moral people, oughtn't it? It might, quietly interpolated Belknap, who by now was very much interested and a little hopeful. He sees that he's done her wrong, continued Jeffson, intent. Like a spider spinning a web, on his own plan, and in spite of all his affection for this other girl. He's now ready to do the right thing by this Alden girl. Do you see, because he's sorry and ashamed of himself. That takes the black look off his plotting to kill her while spending those two nights in Utica and Grass Lake with her. He still loves the other girl, though? interjected Belknap. Well, sure. He likes her at any rate, has been fascinated by that life down there and sort of taken out of himself, made over into a different person, but now he's ready to marry Roberta. In case, after telling her all about this other girl and his love for her, she still wants him to. I see. But how about the boat now in that bag and his going up to this Finchley girl's place afterwards? Just a minute. Just a minute. I'll tell you about that, continued Jeffson his blue eyes boring into space like a powerful electric ray. Of course, he goes out in the boat with her, and of course he takes that bag, and of course he signs those registers falsely. And walks away through those woods to that other girl, after Roberta is drowned. But why? Why? Do you want to know why? I'll tell you. He felt sorry for her, see, and he wanted to marry her, or at least he wanted to do the right thing by her at the very last there. Not before, not before remember, but after he had spent a night with her in Utica and another one in Grass Lake. But once she was drowned, and accidentally, of course. As he says, there was his love for that other girl. He hadn't ceased loving her even though he was willing to sacrifice her in order to do the right thing by Roberta. See? I see. And how are they going to prove that he didn't experience a change of heart if he says he did and sticks to it? I see, but he'll have to tell a mighty convincing story, added Belknap a little heavily. And how about those two hats? They're going to have to be explained. Well, I'm coming to those now. The one he had was a little soiled. And so he decided to buy another. As for that story he told Mason about wearing a cap, well, he was frightened and lied because he thought he would have to get out of it. Now, of course, before he goes to that other girl afterwards. While Roberta is still alive, I mean, there's his relationship with the other girl, what he intends to do about her. He's talking to Roberta, now you see, he continued, and that has to be disposed of in some way. But, as I see it, that's easy, for of course after he experiences a change of heart and wants to do the right thing by Roberta. All he has to do is to write that other girl or go to her and tell her. About the wrong he has done Roberta. Yes. For, as I see it now, she can't be kept out of the case entirely, after all. We'll have to ring her in, I'm afraid. All right. Then we have to, said Belknap. Because you see, if Roberta still feels that he ought to marry her, he'll go first and tell that Finchley girl that he can't marry her. That he's going away. That is, if Roberta doesn't object to his leaving her that long, don't you see? Yes. If she does, he'll marry her, either at Three Mile Bay or some other place. Yes. But you don't want to forget that while she's still alive he's puzzled and distressed. And it's only after that second night, at Grass Lake, that he begins to see how wrong all his actions have been, you understand. Something happens. Maybe she cries or talks about wanting to die, like she does in those letters. Yes. And so he wants a quiet place where they can sit down in peace and talk, where no one else will see or hear them. Yes, yes, go on. Well, he thinks of Big Bittern. He's been up there once before or they're near there, then and just below there, 12 miles. Is Three Mile Bay, where, if they decide to marry, they can. I see. If not, if she doesn't want to marry him after his full confession. He can row her back to the inn, can't he, and he or she can stay there or go on. Yes, 
yes. In the meantime, not to have any delay or be compelled to hang about that inn, it's rather expensive, you know, and he hasn't any too much money. He takes that lunch in his bag. Also his camera, because he wants to take some pictures. For if Mason should turn up with that camera, it's got to be explained. And it will be better explained by us than it will be by him, won't it? I see, I see, exclaimed Belknap, intensely interested by now and actually smiling and beginning to rub his hands. So they go out on the lake. Yes. And they row around. Yes. And finally after lunch on shore, some pictures taken. Yes. He decides to tell her just how things stand with him. He's ready, willing. I get you. Only just before doing that, he wants to take one or two more pictures of her there in the boat, just offshore. Yes. And then he'll tell her, see? Yes. And so they go out in the boat again for a little row, just as he did, see? Yes. But because they intend to go ashore again for some flowers, he's left the bag there, see? That explains the bag. Yes. But before taking any more pictures there, in the boat on the water, he begins to tell her about his love for this other girl. That if she wants him to, now he'll marry her and then write this Sandra a letter. Or, if she feels she doesn't want to marry him with him loving this other girl. Yes, go on. Interrupted Belknap, eagerly. Well, continued Jepson, he'll do his best to take care of her and support her out of the money he'll have after he marries the rich girl. Yes. Well, she wants him to marry her and drop this Miss Finchley. I see. And he agrees? Sure. Also she's so grateful that in her excitement, or gratitude, she jumps up to come toward him, you see? Yes. And the boat rocks a little, and he jumps up to help her because he's afraid she's going to fall, see? Yes, I see. Well, now if we wanted to we could have him have that camera of his in his hand or not, just as you think fit. Yes, I see what you're driving at. Well, whether he keeps it in his hand or doesn't, there's some misstep on his part or hers, just as he says, or just the motion of the two bodies. Causes the boat to go over. And he strikes her, or not, just as you think fit, but accidentally, of course. Yes, I see, and I'll be damned, exclaimed Belknap. Fine, Reuben. Excellent. Wonderful, really. And the boat strikes her too, as well as him. A little, see? Went on Jepson, paying no attention to this outburst, so interested was he in his own plot, and makes him a little dizzy, too. I see. And he hears her cries and sees her, but he's a little stunned himself, see? And by the time he's ready to do something. She's gone, concluded Belknap, quietly. Drowned. I get you. And then, because of all those other suspicious circumstances and false registrations, and because now she's gone and he can't do anything more for her, anyhow. Her relatives might not want to know her condition, you know. I see. He slips away, frightened, a moral coward, just as we'll have to contend from the first, anxious to stand well with his uncle and not lose his place in this world. Doesn't that explain it? About as well as anything could explain it, Reuben, I think. In fact, I think it's a plausible explanation and I congratulate you. I don't see how anyone could hope to find a better. If that doesn't get him off, or bring about a disagreement, at least we might get him off with, well, say, twenty years, don't you think? And very much cheered, he got up. And after eyeing his long, thin associate admiringly, added, fine. While Jefferson, his blue eyes for all the world like windless, still pools, looked steadily back. But of course you know what that means? Jefferson now added, calmly and softly. That we have to put him on the witness stand? Surely, surely. I see that well enough. But it's his only chance. And he won't strike people as a very steady or convincing fellow, I'm afraid, too nervous and emotional. Yes, I know all that, replied Belknap, quickly. He's easily rattled. And Mason will go after him like a wild bull. But we'll have to coach him as to all this drill him. Make him understand that it's his only chance, that his very life depends on it. Drill him for months. If he fails, then he is gone. If only we could do something to give him courage, teach him to act it out. Jefferson's eyes seemed to be gazing directly before him at the very courtroom scene in which Clyde on the stand would have Mason before him. And then picking up Roberta's letters, copies of them furnished by Mason, and looking at them, 
he concluded, if it only weren't for these, here. He weighed them up and down in his hand. Christ. He finally concluded, darkly. What a case. But we're not licked yet. Not by a darn sight. Why, we haven't begun to fight yet. And we'll get a lot of publicity, anyhow. By the way, he added. I'm having a fellow I know down near Big Bitter and Dredge for the camera tonight. Wish me a luck. Do I? Was all Belknap replied. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 17. The Struggle and Excitement of a Great Murder Trial. Belknap and Jefferson, after consulting with Brookhart and Catchaman, learning that they considered Jefferson's plan perhaps the only way, but with as little reference to the Griffiths as possible. And then at once, Messrs. Belknap and Jefferson issuing preliminary statements framed in such a manner as to show their faith in Clyde. Presenting him as being, in reality, a much maligned and entirely misunderstood youth, whose intentions and actions toward Miss Alden were as different from those set forth by Mason as white from black. And intimating that the undue haste of the district attorney in seeking a special term of the Supreme Court might possibly have a political rather than a purely legal meaning. Else why the hurry, especially in the face of an approaching county election? Could there be any plan to use the results of such a trial as this to further any particular person's, or group of person's, political ambitions? Messrs. Belknap and Jepson begged to hope not. But regardless of such plans or the prejudices or the political aspirations of any particular person or group, the defense in this instance did not propose to permit a boy as innocent as Clyde. Trapped by circumstances, as counsel for the defense would be prepared to show. To be railroaded to the electric chair merely to achieve a victory for the Republican Party in November. Furthermore, to combat these strange and yet false circumstances, the defense would require a considerable period of time to prepare its case. Therefore, it would be necessary for them to file a formal protest at Albany against the district attorney's request to the governor for a special term of the Supreme Court. There was no need for the same, since the regular term for the trial of such cases would fall in January and the preparation of their case would require that much time. But while this strong, if rather belated, reply was listened to with proper gravity by the representatives of the various newspapers. Mason vigorously poo-pooed this windy assertion of political plotting, as well as the talk of Clyde's innocence. What reason have I, a representative of all the people of this county, to railroad this man anywhere or make one single charge against him unless the charges make themselves? Doesn't the evidence itself show that he did kill this girl? And has he ever said or done one thing to clear up any of the suspicious circumstances? No. Silence or lies. And until these circumstances are disproved by these very able gentlemen, I am going right ahead. I have all the evidence necessary to convict this young criminal now. And to delay it until January, when I shall be out of office, as they know, and when a new man will have to go over all this evidence with which I have familiarized myself is to entail great expense to the county. For all the witnesses I have gotten together are right here now. Easy to bring into Bridgeburg without any great expense to the county. But where will they be next January or February, especially after the defense has done its best to scatter them? No, sir. I will not agree to it. But, if within ten days or two weeks from now even, they can bring me something that will so much as make it look as though even some of the charges I have made are not true. I'll be perfectly willing to go before the presiding judge with them. And if they can show him any evidence they have or hope to have, or that there are any distant known witnesses to be secured who can help prove this fellow's innocence. Why, then, well and good. I'll be willing to ask the judge to grant them as much time as he may see fit, even if it throws the trial over until I am out of office. But if the trial comes up while I'm here, as I honestly hope it will, I'll prosecute it to the best of my ability. Not because I'm looking for an office of any kind but because I am now the district attorney and it is my duty to do so. And as for my being in politics, well, Mr. Belknap is in politics, isn't he? He ran against me the last time, and I hear he desires to run again. Accordingly he proceeded to Albany further to impress upon the governor the very great need of an immediate special term of the court so that Clyde might be indicted. And the governor, hearing the personal arguments of both Mason and Belknap, decided in favor of Mason, on the ground that the granting of a special term did not militate against any necessary delay of the trial of the case. Since nothing which the defense as yet had to offer seemed to indicate that the calling of a special term was likely in any way to prevent it from obtaining as much time wherein to try the case as needed. Besides, 
It would be the business of the Supreme Court justice appointed to consider such arguments, not himself. And accordingly, a special term of the Supreme Court was ordered, with one Justice Frederick Oberwaltzer of the 11th Judicial District designated to preside. And when Mason appeared before him with the request that he fix the date of the special grand jury by which Clyde might be indicted, this was set for August 5th. And then that body sitting, it was no least trouble for Mason to have Clyde indicted. And thereafter the best that Belknap and Jepson could do was to appear before Oberwaltzer, a Democrat, who owed his appointment to a previous governor. To argue for a change of venue, on the ground that by no possible stretch of the imagination could any twelve men residing in Cataraque County be found who, owing to the public and private statements of Mason, were not already vitally opposed to Clyde and so convinced of his guilt that before ever such a jury could be addressed by a defense, he would be convicted. But where are you going then? inquired Justice Oberwaltzer, who was impartial enough. The same material has been published everywhere. But, Your Honor, this crime which the district attorney here has been so busy in magnifying, a long and heated objection on the part of Mason. But we contend just the same, continued Belknap, that the public has been unduly stirred and deluded. You can't get twelve men now who will try this man fairly. What nonsense, exclaimed Mason, angrily. Mere twaddle. Why, the newspapers themselves have gathered and published more evidence than I have. It's the publicly discovered facts in this case that have aroused prejudice, if any has been aroused. But no more than would be aroused anywhere, I maintain. Besides, if this case is to be transferred to a distant county when the majority of the witnesses are right here, this county is going to be saddled with an enormous expense. Which it cannot afford and which the facts do not warrant. Justice Oberwaltzer, who was of a sober and moral turn, a slow and meticulous man inclined to favor conservative procedure in all things, was inclined to agree. And after five days, in which he did not more than muse idly upon the matter, he decided to deny the motion. If he were wrong, there was the appellate division to which the defense could resort. As for stays, having fixed the date of the trial for October 15th. Ample time, as he judged, for the defense to prepare its case, he adjourned for the remainder of the summer to his cottage on Blue Mountain Lake where both the prosecution and the defense, should any naughty or locally insoluble legal complication arise, would be able to find him and have his personal attention. But with the entry of the Messrs. Belknap and Jeffson into the case, Mason found it advisable to redouble his efforts to make positive, in so far as it were possible, the conviction of Clyde. He feared the young Jeffson as much as he did Belknap. And for that reason, taking with him Burden Burley and Earl Newcomb, he now revisited Lycurgus, where among other things he was able to discover. 1. Where Clyde had purchased the camera. 2. That three days before his departure for Big Bittern he had said to Mrs. Peyton that he was thinking of taking his camera with him and that he must get some films for it. 3. That there was a haberdasher by the name of Orrin Short who had known Clyde well and that but four months before Clyde had applied to him for advice in connection with a factory hand's pregnant wife, also, and this in great confidence to Burton Burley who had unearthed him, that he had recommended to Clyde a certain Dr. Glenn, near Gloversville. 4. Dr. Glenn himself being sought in pictures of Clyde and Roberta being submitted, he was able to identify Roberta, although not Clyde, and to describe the state of mind in which she had approached him, as well as the story she had told. A story which in no way incriminated Clyde or herself, and which, therefore, Mason decided might best be ignored, for the present, anyhow. And, 5. By these same enthusiastic efforts, there rose to the surface the particular hat salesman in Utica who had sold Clyde the hat. For Burton Burley being interviewed while in Utica, and his picture published along with one of Clyde, this salesman chanced to see it and recalling him at once made haste to communicate with Mason, with the result that his testimony, properly typewritten and sworn to, was carried away by Mason. And, in addition, the country girl who had been on the steamer Cygnus and who had noticed Clyde, wrote Mason that she remembered him wearing a straw hat. Also his leaving the boat at Sharon, a bit of evidence which most fully confirmed that of the captain of the boat and caused Mason to feel that providence or fate was working with him. And last, but most important of all to him, there came a communication from a woman residing in Bedford, Pennsylvania, who announced that during the week of July 3rd to 10th, she and her husband had been camping on the east shore of Big Bittern near the southern end of the lake. And while rowing on the lake on the afternoon of July 8, at about 6 o'clock, 
She had heard a cry which sounded like that of a woman or girl in distress, a plaintive, mournful cry. It was very faint and had seemed to come from beyond the island which was to the south and west of the bay in which they were fishing. Mesa now proposed to remain absolutely silent regarding this information, and that about the camera and films and the data regarding Clyde's offense in Kansas City. Until nearer the day of trial, or during the trial itself, when it would be impossible for the defense to attempt either to refute or ameliorate it in any way. As for Belknap and Jepson, apart from drilling Clyde in the matter of his general denial based on his change of heart once he had arrived at Grass Lake, and the explanation of the two hats and the bag, they could not see that there was much to do. True. There was the suit thrown in Fourth Lake near the Cranstons, but after much trolling on the part of a seemingly casual fisherman, that was brought up. Cleaned and pressed, and now hung in a locked closet in the Belknap and Jepson office. Also, there was the camera at Big Bittern, dived for but never found by them, a circumstance which led Jepson to conclude that Mason must have it. And so caused him to decide that he would refer to it at the earliest possible opportunity at the trial. But as for Clyde striking her with it, even accidentally, well, it was decided at that time at least, to contend that he had not. Although after exhuming Roberta's body at Bilts it had been found that the marks on her face, even at this date, did correspond in some degree to the size and shape of the camera. For, in the first place, they were exceedingly dubious of Clyde as a witness. Would he or would he not, in telling of how it all happened, be sufficiently direct or forceful and sincere to convince any jury that he had so struck her without intending to strike her? For on that, marks or no marks, would depend whether the jury was going to believe him and if it did not believe that he struck her accidentally, then a verdict of guilty, of course. And so they prepared to await the coming of the trial, only working betimes and in so far as they dared, to obtain testimony or evidence as to Clyde's previous good character. But being blocked to a degree by the fact that in Lycurgus, while pretending to be a model youth outwardly, he had privately been conducting himself otherwise. And that in Kansas City his first commercial efforts had resulted in such a scandal. However, one of the most difficult matters in connection with Clyde and his incarceration here, as Belknap and Jepson as well as the prosecution saw it, was the fact that thus far not one single member of his own or his uncle's family had come forward to champion him. And to no one save Belknap and Jepson had he admitted where his parents were, yet would it not be necessary. As both Belknap and Jepson argued from time to time, if any case at all were to be made out for him, to have his mother or father, or at least a sister or a brother, come forward to say a good word for him? Otherwise, Clyde might appear to be a pariah, one who had been from the first a drifter and a waster and was now purposely being avoided by all who knew him. For this reason, at their conference with Dara Brookhart they had inquired after Clyde's parents and had learned that in so far as the Griffiths of Lycurgus were concerned, there lay a deep objection to bringing on any member of this western branch of the family. There was, as he explained, a great social gap between them, which it would not please the Lycurgus Griffiths to have exploited here. Besides, who could say but that once Clyde's parents were notified or discovered by the yellow press, they might not lend themselves to exploitation. Both Samuel and Gilbert Griffiths, as Brooke Hart now informed Belknap, had suggested that it was best, if Clyde did not object, to keeping his immediate relatives in the background. In fact, on this, in some measure at least, was likely to depend the extent of their financial aid to Clyde. Clyde was in accord with this wish of the Griffiths, although no one who talked with him sufficiently or heard him express how sorry he was on his mother's account that all this had happened, could doubt the quality of the blood and emotional tie that held him and his mother together. The complete truth was that his present attitude toward her was a mixture of fear and shame because of the manner in which she was likely to view his predicament. His moral if not his social failure. Would she be willing to believe the story prepared by Belknap and Jepson as to his change of heart? But even apart from that, to have her come here now and look at him through these bars when he was so disgraced. To be compelled to face her and talk to her day after day. Her clear, inquiring, tortured eyes. Her doubt as to his innocence, since he could feel that even Belknap and Jepson, in spite of all their plans for him, were still a little dubious as to that unintentional blow of his. They did not really believe it, and they might tell her that. And would his religious, God-fearing, crime-abhorring mother be more credulous than they? Being asked again what he thought ought to be done about his parents, he replied that he did not believe he could face his mother yet. It would do no good and would only torture both. And fortunately, as he saw it, 
Apparently no word of all that had befallen him had yet reached his parents in Denver, because of their peculiar religious and moral beliefs. All copies of worldly and degenerate daily papers were consistently excluded from their home and mission, and the like Hergus Griffiths had had no desire to inform them. Yet one night, at about the time that Belknap and Jepson were most seriously debating the absence of his parents and what, if anything, should be done about it, as to who some time after Clyde had arrived in Lycurgus had married and was living in the southeast portion of Denver, chanced to read in the Rocky Mountain News. And this just subsequent to Clyde's indictment by the grand jury of Bridgeburg. Boyslayer of Working Girl indicted. Bridgeburg, N. Y., August 6, a special grand jury appointed by Governor Stouterback, of this state, to sit in the case of Clyde Griffiths. The nephew of the wealthy collar manufacturer of the same name, of Lycurgus, New York, recently charged with the killing of Miss Roberta Alden, of Biltz, New York. At Big Bittern Lake in the Adirondacks on July 8 last, today returned an indictment charging murder in the first degree. Subsequent to the indictment, Griffiths, who in spite of almost overwhelming evidence, has persisted in asserting that the alleged crime was an accident. And who, accompanied by his counsel, Alvin Belknap, and Reuben Jeffson, of this city, was arraigned before Supreme Court Justice Oberwaltzer, pleaded not guilty. He was remanded for trial, which was set for October 15. Young Griffiths, who is only 22 years of age, and up to the day of his arrest a respected member of Lycurgus Smart Society, is alleged to have stunned and then drowned his working girl's sweetheart, whom he had wronged and then planned to desert in favor of a richer girl. The lawyers in this case have been retained by his wealthy uncle of Lycurgus who has hitherto remained aloof. But apart from this, it is locally asserted. No relative has come forward to aid in his defense. As Tuffworth with made a hurried departure for her mother's home. Despite the directness and clarity of this she was not willing to believe it was Clyde. Still there was the damning force of geography and names. The rich like Hergus Griffiths, the absence of his own relatives. As quickly as the local streetcar would carry her. She now presented herself at the combined lodging house and mission known as the Star of Hope, in Buildwell Street, which was scarcely better than that formerly maintained in Kansas City. For while it provided a number of rooms for wayfarers at 25 cents a night, and was supposed to be self-supporting, it entailed much work with hardly any more profit. Besides, by now, both Frank and Julia, who long before this had become irked by the drab world in which they found themselves, had earnestly sought to free themselves of it leaving the burden of the mission work on their father and mother. Julia, now 19, was cashiering for a local downtown restaurant, and Frank, nearing 17, had but recently found work in a fruit and vegetable commission house. In fact, the only child about the place by day was little Russell, the illegitimate son of Esta, now between three and four years of age, and most reservedly fictionalized by his grandparents as an orphan whom they had adopted in Kansas City. He was a dark-haired child, in some ways resembling Clyde, who, even at this early age, as Clyde had been before him, was being instructed in those fundamental verities which had irritated Clyde in his own childhood. At the time that Esta, now a decidedly subdued and reserved wife, entered, Mrs. Griffiths was busy sweeping and dusting and making up beds. But on sight of her daughter at this unusual hour approaching, and with blanched cheeks signaling her to come inside the door of a vacant room, Mrs. Griffiths, who, because of years of difficulties of various kinds, was more or less accustomed to scenes such as this. Now paused in wonder, the swiftly beclouding mist of apprehension shining in her eyes. What new misery or ill was this? For decidedly Esta's weak gray eyes and manner indicated distress. And in her hand was folded a paper, which she opened and after giving her mother a most solicitous look, pointed to the item, toward which Mrs. Griffiths now directed her look. But what was this? Boy Slayer of Working Girl Sweetheart indicted. Charged with the killing of Miss Roberta Alden at Big Bittern Lake in the Adirondacks on July 8 last. Returned indictment charging murder in the first degree. In spite of almost overwhelming circumstantial evidence. Pleaded not guilty. Remanded for trial. Set for October 15. Stunned and drowned his working girl sweetheart. No relative has come forward. It was thus that her eye and her mind automatically selected the most essential lines, and then as swiftly going over them again. Clyde Griffiths, nephew of the wealthy collar manufacturer of Lycurgus, New York. Clyde, her son. And only recently, but no, 
over a month ago, and they had been worrying a little as to that, she and Asa, because he had not, July 8th. And it was now August 11th. Then, yes. But not her son. Impossible. Clyde the murderer of a girl who was his sweetheart. But he was not like that. He had written to her how he was getting along, the head of a large department, with a future. But of no girl. But now. And yet that other little girl there in Kansas City. Merciful God. And the Griffiths, of Lycurgus, her husband's brother, knowing of this and not writing. Ashamed, disgusted, no doubt. Indifferent. But no, he had hired two lawyers. Yet the horror. Asa. Her other children. What the papers would say. This mission. They would have to give it up and go somewhere else again. Yet was he guilty or not guilty? She must know that before judging or thinking. This paper said he had pleaded not guilty. Oh, that wretched, worldly, showy hotel in Kansas City. Those other bad boys. Those two years in which he wandered here and there, not writing, passing as Harry Tennant. Doing what? Learning what? She paused, full of that intense misery and terror which no faith in the revealed and comforting verities of God and mercy and salvation which she was always proclaiming. Could for the moment fend against. Her boy. Her Clyde. In jail, accused of murder. She must wire. She must write. She must go, maybe. But how to get the money? What to do when she got there? How to get the courage, the faith, to endure it? Yet again. Neither Asa nor Frank nor Julia must know. Asa, with his protesting and yet somehow careworn faith, his weak eyes and weakening body. And must Frank and Julia, now just starting out in life, be saddled with this? Marked thus? Merciful God! Would her troubles never end? She turned, her big, workhorn hands trembling slightly, shaking the paper she held, while Esta, who sympathized greatly with her mother these days because of all she had been compelled to endure, stood by. She looked so tired at times, and now to be racked by this. Yet, as she knew, her mother was the strongest in the family. So erect, so square-shouldered, defiant, a veritable soul pilot in her cross-grained, uniformed way. Mama, I just can't believe it can be Clyde, was all Esta could say now. It just can't be, can it? But Mrs. Griffiths merely continued to stare at that ominous headline, then swiftly ran her gray-blue eyes over the room. Her broad face was blanched and dignified by an enormous strain and an enormous pain. Her ring, misguided. No doubt unfortunate, son. With all his wild dreams of getting on and up, was in danger of death, of being electrocuted for a crime, for murder. He had killed someone. A poor working girl, the paper said. SSH, she whispered, putting one finger to her own lips as a sign. He, indicating Asa, must not know yet, anyhow. We must wire first, or write. You can have the answers come to you, maybe. I will give you the money. But I must sit down somewhere now for a minute. I feel a little weak. I'll sit here. Let me have the Bible. On the small dresser was a Gideon Bible, which, sitting on the edge of the commonplace iron bed, she now opened instinctively at Psalms 3 and 4. Lord, how are they increased that trouble? Hear me, when I call, O God of my righteousness. And then reading on silently, even placidly apparently, through 6, 8, 10, 13, 23, 91, while Esta stood by in silent amazement and misery. Oh, Mama, I just can't believe it. Oh, this is too terrible. But Mrs. Griffiths read on. It was as if, and in spite of all this, she had been able to retreat into some still, silent place, where, for the time being at least, no evil human ill could reach her. Then at last, quite calmly closing the book, and rising, she went on. Now, we must think out what to say and who to send that telegram to, I mean to Clyde, of course, at that place, wherever it is. Bridgeburg, she added, looking at the paper, and then interpolating from the Bible, by terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God. Or, maybe, those two lawyers, their names are there. I'm afraid to wire Ace's brother for fear he'll wire back to him. Then, thou art my bulwark and my strength. In thee will I trust. But I suppose they would give it to him if we sent it care of that judge or those lawyers, don't you think? But it would be better if we could send it to him direct, I suppose. He leadeth me by the still waters, just say that I have read about him and still have faith and love for him, but he is to tell me the truth and what to do. 
If he needs money we will have to see what we can do, I suppose. He restoreth my soul. And then, despite her sudden peace of the moment, she once more began wringing her large, rough hands. Oh, it can't be true. Oh, dear, no. After all, he is my son. We all love him and have faith. We must say that. God will deliver him. Watch and pray. Have faith. Under his wings shalt thou trust. She was so beside herself that she scarcely knew what she was saying. And as Ta, at her side, was saying. Yes, Mama. Oh. Of course. Yes, I will. I know he'll get it all right. But she, too, was saying to herself, My God. My God. What could be worse than this, to be accused of murder? But, of course, it can't be true. It can't be true. If he should hear. She was thinking of her husband. And after Russell, too. And Clyde's trouble there in Kansas City. Poor Mama. She has so much trouble. Together, after a time, and avoiding Asa who was in an adjoining room helping with the cleaning, the two made their way to the general mission room below. Where was silence and many placards which proclaimed the charity, the wisdom, and the sustaining righteousness of God. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 18. The telegram, worded in the spirit just described, was forthwith dispatched care of Belknap and Jefferson, who immediately counseled Clyde what to reply, that all was well with him, that he had the best of advice and would need no financial aid. Also that until his lawyers advised it. It would be best if no member of the family troubled to appear. Since everything that could possibly be done to aid him was already being done. At the same time they wrote Mrs. Griffiths. Assuring her of their interest in Clyde and advising her to let matters rest as they were for the present. Despite the fact that the Griffiths were thus restrained from appearing in the East, neither Belknap nor Jefferson were averse to some news of the existence. Whereabouts, faith and sympathy of Clyde's most immediate relatives creeping into the newspapers, since the latter were so persistent in referring to his isolation. And in this connection they were aided by the fact that his mother's telegram on being received in Bridgeburg was at once read by individuals who were particularly interested in the case and by them whispered to the public and the press. With the result that in Denver the family was at once sought out and interviewed. And shortly after, there was circulated in all the papers east and west a more or less complete account of the present state of Clyde's family. The nature of the mission conducted by them as well as their narrow and highly individualistic religious beliefs and actions, even the statement that often in his early youth Clyde had been taken into the streets to sing and pray. A revelation which shocked Lycurgus and Twelfth Lake Society about as much as it did him. At the same time, Mrs. Griffiths, being an honest woman and wholeheartedly sincere in her faith and in the good of her work, did not hesitate to relate to reporter after reporter who called. All the details of the missionary work of her husband and herself in Denver and elsewhere. Also that neither Clyde nor any of the other children had ever enjoyed the opportunities that come to most. However, her boy, whatever the present charge might be, was not innately bad, and she could not believe that he was guilty of any such crime. It was all an unfortunate and accidental combination of circumstances which he would explain at the trial. However, whatever foolish thing he might have done, it was all to be attributed to an unfortunate accident which broke up the mission work in Kansas City a few years before and compelled the removal of the family from there to Denver, leaving Clyde to make his way alone. And it was because of advice from her that he had written her husband's rich brother in Lycurgus, which led to his going there. A series of statements which caused Clyde in his cell to tingle with a kind of prideful misery and resentment and forced him to write his mother and complain. Why need she always talk so much about the past and the work that she and his father were connected with, when she knew that he had never liked it and resented going on the streets? Many people didn't see it as she and his father did. Particularly his uncle and cousin and all those rich people he had come to know, and who were able to make their way in so different and much more brilliant fashion. And now, as he said to himself, Sandra would most certainly read this, all that he had hoped to conceal. Yet even in the face of all this, because of so much sincerity and force in his mother, he could not help but think of her with affection and respect, and because of her sure and unfailing love for him. With emotion. For in answer to his letter she wrote that she was sorry if she had hurt his feelings or injured him in any way. But must not the truth be shown always? The ways of God were for the best and surely no harm could spring from service in his cause. He must not ask her to lie. But if he said the word, she would so gladly attempt to raise the necessary money and come to his aid sit in his cell and plan with him. Holding his hands. 
But as Clyde so well knew and thought at this time and which caused him to decide that she must not come yet, demanding of him the truth. With those clear, steady blue eyes of hers looking into his own, he could not stand that now. For, frowning directly before him, like a huge and basalt headland above a troubled and angry sea, was the trial itself, with all that it implied. The fierce assault of Mason which he could only confront, for the most part, with the lies framed for him by Jefferson and Belknap. For, although he was constantly seeking to salve his conscience with the thought that at the last moment he had not had the courage to strike Roberta. Nevertheless this other story was so terribly difficult for him to present and defend. A fact which both Belknap and Jepson realized and which caused the latter to appear most frequently at Clyde's cell door with a greeting. Well, how's tricks today? The peculiarly rusty and disheveled and indifferently tailored character of Jepson's suits. The worn and disarranged effect of his dark brown soft hat, pulled low over his eyes. His long, bony, knotty hands, suggesting somehow an enormous tensile strength. And the hard, small blue eyes filled with a shrewd determined cunning and courage, with which he was seeking to inoculate Clyde, and which somehow did inoculate him. Any more preachers around today? Any more country girls or Mason's boys? For during this time, because of the enormous interest aroused by the pitiable death of Roberta, as well as the evidence of her rich and beautiful rival, Clyde was being visited by every type of shallow crime or sex-curious country bumpkin lawyer, doctor, merchant, yokel evangelist or minister all friends or acquaintances of one or another of the officials of the city. And who, standing before his cell door betimes, and at the most unexpected moments, and after surveying him with curious, or resentful, or horrified eyes, ask such questions as. Do you pray, brother? Do you get right down on your knees and pray? Clyde was reminded of his mother and father at such times, had he made his peace with God? Did he actually deny that he had killed Roberta Alden? In the case of three country girls, would you mind telling us the name of the girl you are supposed to be in love with, and where she is now? We won't tell anyone. Will she appear at the trial? Questions which Clyde could do no more than ignore, or if not, answer as equivocally or evasively or indifferently as possible. For although he was inclined to resent them, still was he not being constantly instructed by both Belknap and Jepson that for the good of his own cause he must try to appear genial and civil and optimistic? Then there came also newspaper men, or women, accompanied by artists or photographers, to interview and make studies of him. But with these, for the most part and on the advice of Belknap and Jefferson he refused to communicate or said only what he was told to say. You can talk all you want, suggested Jefferson, genially, so long as you don't say anything. And the stiff upper lip, you know. And the smile that won't come off, see? Not failing to go over that list, are you? He had provided Clyde with a long list of possible questions which no doubt would be asked him on the stand and which he was to answer according to answers typewritten beneath them, or to suggest something better. They all related to the trip to Big Bittern. His reason for the extra hat, his change of heart. Why, when, where, that's your litany, you know. And then he might light a cigarette without ever offering one to Clyde, since for the sake of a reputation for sobriety he was not to smoke here. And for a time, after each visit, Clyde finding himself believing that he could and would do exactly as Jefferson had said, walk briskly and smartly into court. There up against every one, every eye, even that of Mason himself, forget that he was afraid of him, even when on the witness stand. Forget all the terror of those many facts in Mason's possession, which he was to explain with this list of answers. Forget Roberta and her last cry, and all the heartache and misery that went with the loss of Sandra and her bright world. Yet, with the night having once more fallen, or the day dragging on with only the lean and bearded crowd or the sly and evasive Cecil, or both, hanging about. Or coming to the door to say, howdy. Or to discuss something that had occurred in town, or to play chess, or checkers, Clyde growing more and more moody and deciding, maybe, that there was no real hope for him after all. For how alone he was, except for his attorneys and mother and brother and sisters. Never a word from Sandra, of course. For along with her recovery to some extent from her original shock and horror, she was now thinking somewhat differently of him, that after all it was for love of her, perhaps. That he had slain Roberta and made himself the pariah and victim that he now was. Yet, because of the immense prejudice and horror expressed by the world, she was by no means able to think of venturing to send him a word. Was he not a murderer? 
and in addition, that miserable western family of his, pictured as street preachers, and he, too, or as a singing and praying boy from a mission. Yet occasionally returning in thought, and this quite in spite of herself, to his eager, unreasoning and seemingly consuming enthusiasm for her. How deeply he must have cared to venture upon so deadly a deed. And hence wondering whether at some time, once this case was less violently before the public eye, it might not be possible to communicate with him in some guarded and unsigned way. Just to let him know, perhaps, that because of his great love for her she desired him to know that he was not entirely forgotten. Yet as instantly deciding, no, no, her parents, if they should learn, or guess, or the public, or her one-time associates. Not now, oh, not now at least. Maybe later if he were set free, or, or, convicted, she couldn't tell. Yet suffering heartaches for the most part, as much as she detested and abhorred the horrible crime by which he had sought to win her. And in the interim, clad in his cell, walking to and fro. Or looking out on the dull square through the heavily barred windows, or reading and rereading the newspapers, or nervously turning the pages of magazines or books furnished by his counsel. Or playing chess or checkers, or eating his meals, which, by special arrangement on the part of Belknap and Jefferson, made at the request of his uncle, consisted of better dishes than were usually furnished to the ordinary prisoner. Yet with the iterated and reiterated thought, based on the seemingly irreparable and irreconcilable loss of Sandra, as to whether it was possible for him to go on with this. Make this, as he at times saw it, almost useless fight. At times, in the middle of the night or just before dawn, with all the prison silent. Dreams. A ghastly picture of all that he most feared and that dispelled every trace of courage and drove him instantly to his feet, his heart pounding wildly, his eyes strained. A cold damp upon his face and hands. That chair, somewhere in the state penitentiary. He had read of it, how men died in it. And then he would walk up and down, thinking how, how, in case it did not come about as Jefferson felt so sure that it would, in case he was convicted and a new trial refused. Then, well, then, might one be able to break out of such a jail as this, maybe, and run away? These old brick walls. How thick were they? But was it possible that with a hammer or a stone, or something that someone might bring him, his brother Frank, or his sister Julia, or Ratterer, or Hegland? If only he could get in communication with some one of them and get him or her to bring him something of the kind. If only he could get a saw, to saw those bars. And then run, run as he should have in those woods up there that time. But how? And with her? End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 19. October 15th, with gray clouds and a sharp, almost January wind that herded the fallen leaves into piles and then scurried them in crisp and windy gusts like flying birds here and there. And, in spite of the sense of struggle and tragedy in the minds of many. With an electric chair as the shadowy mental background to it all. A sense of holiday or festival with hundreds of farmers, woodsmen, traders, entering in Fords and Buicks, farmer wives and husbands, daughters and sons, even infants in arms, and then idling about the public square long before the time for court to convene, or, as the hour neared, congregating before the county jail in the hope of obtaining a glimpse of Clyde, or before the courthouse door nearest the jail, which was to be the one entrance to the courtroom for the public and Clyde and from which position they could see an assured entrance into the courtroom itself when the time came. And a flock of pigeons parading rather dismally along the cornices and gutters of the upper floor and roof of the ancient court. And with Mason and his staff. Burton Burley, Earl Newcomb. Zilla Saunders, and a young Bridgeburg Law graduate by the name of Manigault, helping to arrange the order of evidence as well as direct or instruct the various witnesses and venere men who were already collecting in the antechamber of the now almost nationally known attorney for the people, and with cries outside of, peanuts, popcorn, hot dogs, get the story of Clive Griffiths, with all the letters of Roberta Alden, only 25 cents, this being a set of duplicate copies of Roberta's letters which had been stolen from Mason's office by an intimate of Burton Burley's and by him sold to a penny dreadful publisher of Binghamton, who immediately issued them in pamphlet form together with an outline of the great plot in Roberta's and Clyde's pictures. And in the meantime, over in the reception or conference room of the jail, Alvin Belknap and Reuben Jeffson, side by side with Clyde, neatly arrayed in the very suit he had sought to sink forever in the waters of Lower Twelfth Flake and with the new tie and shirt and shoes added in order to present him in his Lycurgus best. Jeffson, 
long and lean and shabbily dressed as usual, but with all of that iron and power that so impressed Clyde in every line of his figure and every movement or gesture of his body. Belknap, looking like an Albany bow. The one on whom was to fall the burden of the opening presentation of the case as well as the cross-examining, now saying. Now you're not going to get frightened or show any evidence of nervousness at anything that may be said or done at any time, are you, Clyde? We're to be with you, you know, all through the trial. You sit right between us. And you're going to smile and look unconcerned or interested, just as you wish, but never fearful, but not too bold or gay, you know, so that they'd feel that you're not taking this thing seriously. You understand, just a pleasant, gentlemanly, and sympathetic manner all the time. And not frightened. For that will be certain to do us and you great harm. Since you're innocent, you have no real reason to be frightened, although you're sorry, of course. You understand all that, I know, by now. Yes, sir, I understand, replied Clyde. I will do just as you say. Besides, I never struck her intentionally, and that's the truth. So why should I be afraid? And here he looked at Jefferson, on whom, for psychic reasons, he depended most. In fact the words he had just spoken were the very words which Jepson had so drilled into him during the two months just passed. And catching the look. Jepson now drew closer and fixing Clyde with his gimlet and yet encouraging and sustaining blue eyes, began. You're not guilty. You're not guilty, Clyde, see? You understand that fully by now, and you must always believe and remember that, because it's true. You didn't intend to strike her, do you hear? You swear to that. You have sworn it to me and Belknap here, and we believe you. Now, it doesn't make the least bit of difference that because of the circumstances surrounding all this we are not going to be able to make the average jury see this or believe it just as you tell it. That's neither here nor there. I've told you that before. You know what the truth is, and so do we. But, in order to get justice for you, we've had to get up something else. A dummy or substitute for the real fact, which is that you didn't strike her intentionally, but which we cannot hope to make them see without disguising it in some way. You get that, don't you? Yes, sir, replied Clyde, always overawed and intrigued by this man. And for that reason, as I've so often told you, we've invented this other story about a change of heart. It's not quite true as to time, but it is true that you did experience a change of heart there in the boat. And that's our justification. But they'd never believe that under all of the peculiar circumstances, so we're merely going to move that change of heart up a little, see? Make it before you ever went into the boat at all. And while we know it isn't true that way, still neither is the charge that you intentionally struck her true, and they're not going to electrocute you for something that isn't true, not with my consent, at least. He looked into Clyde's eyes for a moment more, and then added, It's this way, Clyde. It's like having to pay for potatoes, or for suits of clothes. With corn or beans instead of money, when you have money to pay with but when, because of the crazy notions on the part of someone, they won't believe that the money you have is genuine. So you've got to use the potatoes or beans. And beans is what we're going to give them. But the justification is that you're not guilty. You're not guilty. You've sworn to me that you didn't intend to strike her there at the last, whatever you might have been provoked to do at first. And that's enough for me. You're not guilty. And here, firmly and convincingly, which was the illusion in regard to his own attitude which he was determined to convey to Clyde. He laid hold of his coat lapels, and after looking fixedly into his somewhat strained and now nervous brown eyes, added. And now, whenever you get to feeling weak or nervous, or if, when you go on the stand, you think Mason is getting the best of you, I want you to remember this, just say to yourself, I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty and they can't fairly convict me unless I really am. And if that don't pull you together, look at me. I'll be right there. All you have to do, if you feel yourself rattled, is to look at me, right into my eyes, just as I'm looking at you now, and then you'll know that I'm wanting you to brace up and do what I'm telling you to do now, swear to the things that we are asking you to swear to. However they may look like lies, and however you may feel about them, I'm not going to have you convicted for something you didn't do just because you can't be allowed to swear to what is the truth, not if I can help it. And now that's all. And here he slapped him genially and heartily on the back, while Clyde, strangely heartened, felt, for the time being at least, that certainly he could do as he was told, and would. And then Jefferson, taking out his watch and looking first at Belknap. Then out of the nearest window through which were to be seen the already assembled crowds. 
one about the courthouse steps, a second including newspaper men and women, newspaper photographers and artists, gathered closely before the jail walk. And eagerly waiting to snap Clyde or anyone connected with this case, went calmly on with. Well, it's about time, I guess. Looks as though all Cataraque would like to get inside. We're going to have quite an audience. And turning to Clyde once more, he added. Now, you don't want to let those people disturb you, Clyde. They're nothing but a lot of country people come to town to see a show. And then the two of them, Belknap and Jepson, going out. And Crowd and Cecil coming in to take personal charge of Clyde, while the two lawyers, passing amid whispers, crossed over to the court building in the square of brown grass beyond. And after them, and in less than five minutes, and preceded by Slack and Cecil and followed by Crowd and Swank, yet protected on either side by two extra deputies in case there should be an outbreak or demonstration of any kind. Clyde himself, attempting to look as jaunty and nonchalant as possible, yet because of the many rough and strange faces about him. Men in heavy raccoon coats and caps, and with thick whiskers, or in worn and faded and nondescript clothes such as characterized many of the farmers of this region, accompanied by their wives and children, and all staring so strangely and curiously. He felt not a little nervous, as though at any moment there might be a revolver shot, or someone might leap at him with a knife. The deputies with their hands on their guns lending not a little to the reality of his mood. Yet only cries of, here he comes. Here he comes. There he is. Would you believe that he could do a thing like that? And then the cameras clicking and whirring and his two protectors shouldering closer and closer to him while he shrank down within himself mentally. And then a flight of five brown stone steps leading up to an old courthouse door. And beyond that, an inner flight of steps to a large, long, brown, high ceiling chamber. In which, to the right and left, and in the rear facing east, were tall, thin, round topped windows, fitted with thin panes, admitting a flood of light. And at the west end, a raised platform, with a highly ornamental, dark brown carved bench upon it. And behind it, a portrait, and on either side, north and south. And at the rear, benches and benches in rows, each tier higher than the other, and all crowded with people, the space behind them packed with standing bodies, and all apparently. As he entered, leaning and craning and examining him with sharp keen eyes, while there went about a conversational buzz or brrh. He could hear a general sssss. pppp. As he approached and passed through a gate to an open space beyond it. Wherein, as he could see, were Belknap and Jefferson at a table, and between them a vacant chair for him. And he could see and feel the eyes and faces on which he was not quite willing to look. But directly before him, at another table in the same square. But more directly below the raised platform at the west end, as he could see now, were Mason and several men whom he seemed to recollect. Earl Newcomb and Burton Burley and yet another man whom he had never seen before, all four turning and gazing at him as he came. And about this inner group, an outer circle of men and women writers and sketch artists. And then, after a time, recalling Belknap's advice, he managed to straighten up and with an air of studied ease and courage. Which was belied to a certain extent by his strained, pale face and somewhat hazy stare, look at the writers and artists who were either studying or sketching him. And even to whisper, quite a full house, eh? But just then, and before he could say anything more. A resounding whack, whack, from somewhere. And then a voice, order in the court. His honor, the court. Everybody please rise. And as suddenly the whispering and stirring audience growing completely silent. And then, through a door to the south of the dais, a larger Bain and florid and smooth-faced man, who in an ample black gown, walked swiftly to the large chair immediately behind the desk, and after looking steadily upon all before him. But without appearing to see any one of them seated himself. Whereupon everyone assembled in the courtroom sat down. And then to the left, yet below the judge, at a smaller desk, a smaller and older individual standing and calling, Oh yeah! Oh yeah! All persons having business before the Honorable. The Supreme Court of the State of New York, County of Cataraque, draw near and give attention. This court is now in session. And after that this same individual again rising and beginning. The State of New York against Clyde Griffiths. Then Mason, rising and standing before his table, at once announced. The people are ready. Whereupon Belknap rose, and in a courtly and affable manner, stated, the defendant is ready. Then the same clerk reached into a square box that was before him, and drawing forth a piece of paper, 
called Simeon Dinsmore, whereupon a little, hunched and brown-suited man, with claw-like hands, and a ferret-like face, immediately scuttled to the jury box and was seated. And once there he was approached by Mason, who, in a brisk manner, his flat-nosed face looking most aggressive and his strong voice reaching to the uttermost corners of the court, began to inquire as to his age, his business, whether he was single or married, how many children he had, whether he believed or did not believe in capital punishment. The latter question as Clyde at once noted seemed to stir in him something akin to resentment or suppressed emotion of some kind, for at once and with emphasis, he answered, I most certainly do, for some people. A reply which caused Mason to smile slightly and Jepson to turn and look toward Belknap, who mumbled sarcastically. And they talk about the possibility of a fair trial here. But at the same time Mason feeling that this very honest, if all too convinced farmer, was a little too emphatic in his beliefs, saying, with the consent of the court, the people will excuse the talesman. And Belknap. After an inquiring glance from the judge, nodding his agreement, at which the prospective juror was excused and the clerk, immediately drawing out of the box a second slip of paper, and then calling, Dudley Shearline. Whereupon, a thin, tall man of between thirty-eight and forty, neatly dressed and somewhat meticulous and cautious in his manner, approached and took his place in the box, and Mason once more began to question him as he had the other. In the meantime, Clyde, in spite of both Belknap's and Jefferson's preliminary precautions, was already feeling stiff and chill and bloodless. Four, Decidedly, as he could feel, this audience was inimical. And amid this closely pressing throng, as he now thought, with an additional chill, there must be the father and mother, perhaps also the sisters and brothers, of Roberta. And all looking at him, and hoping with all their hearts, as the newspapers during the weeks past informed him, that he would be made to suffer for this. And again, all those people of Lycurgus and Twelfth Lake, no one of whom had troubled to communicate with him in any way. Assuming him to be absolutely guilty, of course, were any of those here? Jill or Gertrude or Tracy Trumbull, for instance? Or Wynette Fant or her brother? She had been at that camp at Bear Lake the day he was arrested. His mind ran over all the social personages whom he had encountered during the last year and who would now see him as he was. Poor and commonplace and deserted, and on trial for such a crime as this. And after all his bluffing about his rich connections here and in the West. For now, of course, they would believe him as terrible as his original plot, without knowing or caring about his side of the story, his moods and fears. That predicament that he was in with Roberta. His love for Sandra and all that she had meant to him. They wouldn't understand that, and he was not going to be allowed to tell anything in regard to it, even if he were so minded. And yet, because of the advice of Belknap and Jefferson, he must sit up and smile, or at least look pleasant and meet the gaze of everyone boldly and directly. And in consequence, turning, and for the moment feeling absolutely transfixed. For there, God, what a resemblance! To the left of him on one of those wall benches, was a woman or girl who appeared to be the living image of Roberta. It was that sister of hers, Emily, of whom she had often spoken, but oh, what a shock! His heart almost stopped. It might even be Roberta. And transfixing him with what ghostly, and yet real, and savage and accusing eyes. And next to her another girl, looking something like her, too, and next to her that old man. Roberta's father, that wrinkled old man whom he had encountered that day he had called at his farm door for information, now looking at him almost savagely, a grey and weary look that said so plainly. You murderer. You murderer. And beside him a mild and small and ill-looking woman of about fifty, veiled and very shrunken and sunken-eyed, who, at his glance dropped her own eyes and turned away as if stricken with a great pain, not hate. Her mother, no doubt of it. Oh, what a situation was this! How unthinkably miserable! His heart fluttered. His hands trembled. So now to stay himself, he looked down, first at the hands of Belknap and Jefferson on the table before him, since each was toying with a pencil poised above the pad of paper before them. As they gazed at Mason and whoever was in the jury box before him, a foolish-looking fat man now, what a difference between Jefferson's and Belknap's hands, the latter so short and soft and white, the former so long and brown and knotty and bony. And Belknap's pleasant and agreeable manner here in court, his voice, I think I will ask the juror to step down as opposed to Mason's revolver-like excused. Or Jefferson's slow and yet powerful, though whispered, better let him go, Alvin. Nothing in him for us. 
And then all at once Jefferson saying to him, Sit up. Sit up. Look around. Don't sag down like that. Look people in the eye. Smile naturally, Clyde, if you're going to smile at all. Just look them in the eye. They're not going to hurt you. They're just a lot of farmers outside seeing. But Clyde, noting at once that several reporters and artists were studying and then sketching or writing of him, now flushed hotly and weakly, for he could feel their eager eyes and their eager words as clearly as he could hear their scratching pens. And all for the papers, his blanching face and trembling hands, they would have that down, and his mother in Denver and everybody else there in Lycurgus would see and read, how he had looked at the Aldens and they had looked at him and then he had looked away again. Still, still, he must get himself better in hand, sit up once more and look about, or Jefferson would be disgusted with him. And so once more he did his best to crush down his fear, to raise his eyes and then turn slightly and look about. But in doing so, there next to the wall, and to one side of that tall window, and just as he had feared, was Tracy Trumbull, who evidently because of the law interest or his curiosity and what not, no pity or sympathy for him, surely, had come up for this day anyhow. And was looking, not at him for the moment, thank goodness, but at Mason, who was asking the fat man some questions. And next to him at his cells, with nearsighted eyes equipped with thick lenses of great distance power, and looking in Clyde's direction, yet without seeing him apparently, for he gave no sign. Oh, how trying all this! And five rows from them again, in another direction, Mr. and Mrs. Gilpin, whom Mason had found, of course. And what would they testify to now? His calling on Roberta in her room there? And how secret it had all been. That would be bad, of course. And of all people, Mr. and Mrs. George Newton. What were they going to put them on the stand for? To tell about Roberta's life before she got to going with him, maybe? And that Grace Mar, whom he had seen often but met only once out there on Crumb Lake, and whom Roberta had not liked any more. What would she have to say? She could tell how he had met Roberta, of course, but what else? And then, but, no, it could not be, and yet, yet, it was, too, surely, that or in short, of whom he had asked concerning Glenn. Gee. He was going to tell about that now, maybe, no doubt of it. How people seemed to remember things, more than ever he would have dreamed they would have. And again, this side of that third window from the front, but beyond that dreaded group of the Aldens, that very large and whiskered man who looked something like an old-time Quaker turned bandit, Height was his name. He had met him at Three Mile Bay, and again on that day on which he had been taken up to Big Bittern against his will. Oh, yes, the coroner he was. And beside him, that innkeeper up there who had made him sign the register that day. And next to him the boathouse keeper who had rented him the boat. And next to him, that tall, lank guide who had driven him and Roberta over from Gun Lodge. A brown and wiry and loudish man who seemed to pierce him now with small, deep-set, animal-like eyes. And who most certainly was going to testify to all the details of that ride from Gun Lodge. Would his nervousness on that day, and his foolish qualms, be as clearly remembered by him as they were now by himself? And if so, how would that affect his plea of a change of heart? Would he not better talk all that over again with Jepson? But this man Mason. How hard he was. How energetic and how he must have worked to get all of these people here to testify against him. And now here he was, exclaiming as he chanced to look at him. And as he had in at least the last dozen cases, yet with no perceptible result in so far as the jury box was concerned, acceptable to the people. But, invariably, whenever he had done so, Jefferson had merely turned slightly, but without looking, and had said, nothing in him for us, Alvin. As set as a bone. And then Belknap, courteous and bland, had challenged for cause and usually succeeded in having his challenge sustained. But then at last, and oh, how agreeably, the clerk of the court announcing in a clear, thin, rasping and aged voice, a recess until 2 p.m. and Jefferson smilingly turning to Clyde with. Well, Clyde, that's the first round, not so very much to it, do you think? And not very hard either, is it? Better go over there and get a good meal, though. It'll be just as long and dull this afternoon. And in the meantime, Crowd and Cecil, together with the extra deputies, pushing close and surrounding him. And then the crowding and swarming and exclaiming. There he is. There he is. Here he comes. Here. Here. And the large and meaty female pushing as close as possible and staring directly into his face, exclaiming as she did so, Let me see him. I just want to get a good look at you, 
young man. I have two daughters of my own. But without one of all those of Lycurgus or Twelfth Lake whom he had recognized in the public benches, coming near him. And no glimpse of Sandra anywhere, of course. For as both Belknap and Jepson had repeatedly assured him, she would not appear. Her name was not even to be mentioned, if possible. The Griffiths, as well as the Finchleys, were opposed. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 20. And then five entire days consumed by Mason and Belknap in selecting a jury. But at last the twelve men who were to try Clyde, sworn and seated. And such men, odd and grizzled, or tanned and wrinkled, farmers and country storekeepers, with here and there a Ford agent, a keeper of an inn at Tom Dixon's Lake, a salesman in Hamburger's dry goods store at Bridgeburg, and a peripatetic insurance agent residing in Perday just north of Grass Lake. And with but one exception, all married. And with but one exception, all religious, if not moral, and all convinced of Clyde's guilt before ever they sat down. But still because of their almost unanimous conception of themselves as fair and open-minded men. And because they were so interested to sit as jurors in this exciting case, convinced that they could pass fairly and impartially on the facts presented to them. And so, all rising and being sworn in. And at once Mason rising and beginning, gentlemen of the jury. And Clyde, as well as Belknap and Jepson, now gazing at them and wondering what the impression of Mason's opening charge was likely to be. For a more dynamic and electric prosecutor under these particular circumstances was not to be found. This was his opportunity. Were not the eyes of all the citizens of the United States upon him? He believed so. It was as if someone had suddenly exclaimed, Lights! Camera! No doubt many of you have been wearied, as well as puzzled, at times during the past week, he began, by the exceeding care with which the lawyers in this case have passed upon the panels from which you twelve men have been chosen. It has been no light matter to find twelve men to whom all the marshaled facts in this astonishing cause could be submitted and by them weighed with all the fairness and understanding which the law commands. For my part, the care which I have exercised, gentlemen, has been directed by but one motive, that the state shall have justice done. No malice, no preconceived notions of any kind. So late as July 9th last I personally was not even aware of the existence of this defendant, nor of his victim nor of the crime with which he is now charged. But, gentlemen, as shocked and unbelieving as I was at first upon hearing that a man of the age, training and connections of the defendant here could have placed himself in a position to be accused of such an offense. Step by step I was compelled to alter and then dismiss forever from my mind my original doubts and to conclude from the mass of evidence that was literally thrust upon me, that it was my duty to prosecute this action in behalf of the people. But, however that may be, let us proceed to the facts. There are two women in this action. One is dead. The other, and he now turned toward where Clyde sat. And here he pointed a finger in the direction of Belknap and Jefferson, by agreement between the prosecution and the defense is to be nameless here, since no good can come from inflicting unnecessary injury. In fact, the sole purpose which I now announce to you to be behind every word and every fact as it will be presented by the prosecution is that exact justice. According to the laws of this state and the crime with which this defendant is charged, shall be done. Exact justice, gentlemen, exact and fair. But if you do not act honestly and render a true verdict according to the evidence, the people of the state of New York and the people of the county of Cataraqui will have a grievance and a serious one. For it is they who are looking to you for a true accounting for your reasoning and your final decision in this case. And here Mason paused, and then turning dramatically toward Clyde, and with his right index finger pointing toward him at times, continued. The people of the state of New York charge, and he hung upon this one word as though he desired to give it the value of rolling thunder. That the crime of murder in the first degree has been committed by the prisoner at the bar, Clyde Griffiths. They charge that he willfully, and with malice and cruelty and deception, murdered and then sought to conceal forever from the knowledge and the justice of the world. The body of Roberta Alden, the daughter of a farmer who has for years resided near the village of Biltz, in Mimico County. They charge, and here Clyde, because of whispered advice from Jefferson, was leaning back as comfortably as possible and gazing as imperturbably as possible upon the face of Mason, who was looking directly at him. That this same Clyde Griffiths, before ever this crime was committed by him, plotted for weeks the plan and commission of it, and then, with malice aforethought and in cold blood, executed it. And in charging these things, the people of the state of New York expect to, and will, 
produce before you substantiations of every one of them. You will be given facts, and of these facts you, not I, are to be the sole judge. And here he paused once more, and shifting to a different physical position while the eager audience crowded and leaned forward. Hungry and thirsty for every word he should utter, he now lifted one arm and dramatically pushing back his curly hair, resumed. Gentlemen, it will not take me long to picture, nor will you fail to perceive for yourselves as this case proceeds, the type of girl this was whose life was so cruelly blotted out beneath the waters of Big Bittern. All the twenty years of her life, and Mason knew well that she was twenty-three and two years older than Clyde no person who ever knew her ever said one word in criticism of her character. And no evidence to that effect, I am positive. Will be introduced in this trial. Somewhat over a year ago, on July 19th, she went to the city of Lycurgus. In order that by working with her own hands she might help her family. And here the sobs of her parents and sisters and brothers were heard throughout the courtroom. Gentlemen, went on Mason, and from this point carrying on the picture of Roberta's life from the time she first left home to join Grace Mar until having met Clyde on Crumb Lake and fallen out with her friend and patrons, the Newtons. Because of him, she accepted his dictum that she live alone, amid strange people, concealing the suspicious truth of this from her parents, and then finally succumbing to his wiles, the letters she had written him from Biltz detailing every single progressive step in the story. And from there, by the same meticulous process, he proceeded to Clyde, his interest in the affairs of Lycurgus society and the rich and beautiful Miss X, who because of a purely innocent and kindly, if infatuated, indication on her part that he might hope to aspire to her hand, had unwittingly evoked in him a passion which had been the cause of the sudden change in his attitude and emotions toward Roberta, resulting, as Mason insisted he would show, in the plot that had resulted in Roberta's death. But who is the individual, he suddenly and most dramatically exclaimed at this point, against whom I charge all these things? There he sits. Is he the son of wastrel parents? A product of the slums, one who had been denied every opportunity for a proper or honorable conception of the values and duties of a decent and respectable life? Is he? On the contrary. His father is of the same strain that has given Lycurgus one of its largest and most constructive industries, the Griffiths Collar and Shirt Company. He was poor, yes, no doubt of that. But not more so than Roberta Alden, and her character appears not to have been affected by her poverty. His parents in Kansas City, Denver, and before that Chicago and Grand Rapids, Michigan, appear to have been unordained ministers of the proselytizing and mission-conducting type people who, from all I can gather, are really, sincerely religious and right-principled in every sense. But this, their oldest son, and the one who might have been expected to be deeply influenced by them, early turned from their world and took to a more garish life. He became a bellboy in a celebrated Kansas City hotel, the Green Davidson. And now he proceeded to explain that Clyde had ever been a rolling stone. One who, by reason of some quirk of temperament, perhaps, preferred to wander here and there. Later, as he now explained, he had been given an important position as head of a department in the well-known factory of his uncle at Lycurgus. And then gradually he was introduced into the circles in which his uncle and his children were familiar. And his salary was such that he could afford to keep a room in one of the better residences of the city, while the girl he had slain lived in a mean room in a back street. And yet, he continued, how much has been made here of the alleged youth of this defendant? Here he permitted himself a scornful smile. He has been called by his counsel and others in the newspapers a boy, over and over again. He is not a boy. He is a bearded man. He has had more social and educational advantages than any one of you in the jury box. He has traveled in hotels and clubs and the society with which he was so intimately connected in Lycurgus. He has been in contact with decent, respectable, and even able and distinguished people. Why, as a matter of fact, at the time of his arrest two months ago, he was part of as smart a society and summer resort group as this region boasts. Remember that. His mind is immature, not an immature one. It is fully developed and balanced perfectly. Gentlemen, as the state will soon proceed to prove, he went on. It was no more than four months after his arrival in Lycurgus that this dead girl came to work for the defendant in the department of which he was the head. And it was not more than two months after that before he had induced her to move from the respectable and religious home which she had chosen in Lycurgus. To one concerning which she knew nothing and the principal advantage of which 
as he saw it, was that it offered secrecy and seclusion and freedom from observation for the vile purpose which already he entertained in regard to her. There was a rule of the Griffiths Company, as we will later show in this trial, which explains much, and that was that no superior officer or head of any department was permitted to have anything to do with any girls working under him, or for the factory. In or out of the factory. It was not conducive to either the morals or the honor of those working for this great company, and they would not allow it. And shortly after coming there, this man had been instructed as to that rule. But did that deter him? Did the so recent and favorable consideration of his uncle in any way deter him? Not in the least. Secrecy. Secrecy. From the very beginning. Seduction. Seduction. The secret and intended and immoral and illegal and socially unwarranted and condemned use of her body outside the regenerative and ennobling pale of matrimony. That was his purpose, gentlemen. But was it generally known by anyone in Lycurgus or elsewhere that such a relationship as this existed between him and Roberta Alden? Not a soul. Not a soul, as far as I have been able to ascertain, was ever so much as partially aware of this relationship until after this girl was dead. Not a soul. Think of that. Gentlemen of the jury, and here his voice took on an almost reverential tone, Roberta Alden loved this defendant with all the strength of her soul. She loved him with that love which is the crowning mystery of the human brain and the human heart, that transcends in its strength and its weakness all fear of shame or punishment from even the immortal throne above. She was a true and human and decent and kindly girl. A passionate and loving girl. And she loved as only a generous and trusting and self-sacrificing soul can love. And loving so, in the end she gave to him all that any woman can give a man she loves. Friends, this thing has happened millions of times in this world of ours. And it will happen millions and millions of times in the days to come. It is not new and it will never be old. But in January or February last, this girl, who is now dead in her grave, was compelled to come to this defendant, Clyde Griffiths, and tell him that she was about to become a mother. We shall prove to you that then and later she begged him to go away with her and make her his wife. But did he? Would he? Oh, no. For by that time a change had come over the dreams and the affections of Clyde Griffiths. He had had time to discover that the name of Griffiths in Lycurgus was one that would open the doors of Lycurgus exclusive circles. That the man who was no one in Kansas City or Chicago was very much of a person here, and that it would bring him in contact with girls of education and means, girls who moved far from the sphere to which Roberta Alden belonged. Not only that, but he had found one girl to whom, because of her beauty, wealth, position, he had become enormously attached and beside her the little farm and factory girl in the pathetically shabby and secret room to which he had assigned her. Looked poor indeed. Good enough to betray but not good enough to marry. And he would not. Here he paused, but only for a moment, then went on. But at no point have I been able to find the least modification or cessation of any of these social activities on his part which so entranced him. On the contrary, from January to July 5th last, and after, yes, even after she was finally compelled to say to him that unless he could take her away and marry her, she would have to appeal to the sense of justice in the community in which they moved, and after she was cold and dead under the waters of Big Bittern. Dances, lawn fates, automobile parties, dinners, gay trips to Twelfth Lake and Bear Lake, and without a thought, seemingly, that her great moral and social needs should modify his conduct in any way. And here he paused and gazed in the direction of Belknap and Jefferson, who in turn, were not sufficiently disturbed or concerned to do more than smile. First at him and then at each other, although Clyde, terrorized by the force and the vehemence of it all, was chiefly concerned to note how much of exaggeration and unfairness was in all this. But even as he was thinking so, Mason was continuing with. But by this time, gentlemen, as I have indicated, Roberta Alden had become insistent that Griffiths make her his wife. And this he promised to do. Yet, as all the evidence here will show, he never intended to do anything of the kind. On the contrary, when her condition became such that he could no longer endure her pleas or the danger which her presence in Lycurgus unquestionably spelled for him, he induced her to go home to her father's house, with the suggestion, apparently, that she prepare herself by making some necessary clothes, against the day when he would come for her and remove her to some distant city where they would not be known. Yet where is his wife she could honorably bring their child into the world? And according to her letters to him, as I will show, that was to have been in three weeks from the time she departed for her home in Belts. But did he come for her as he had promised? No, he never did. 
Eventually, and solely because there was no other way out, he permitted her to come to him, on July 6 last, exactly two days before her death. But not before, but wait. In the meantime, or from June 5th to July 6th, he allowed her to brood in that little, lonely farmhouse on the outskirts of Biltz in Mimico County, with the neighbors coming in to watch and help her make some clothes. Which even then she did not dare announce as her bridal trousseau. And she suspected and feared that this defendant would fail her. For daily, and sometimes twice daily, she wrote him, telling him of her fears and asking him to assure her by letter or word in some form that he would come and take her away. But did he even do that? Never by letter. Never. Oh, no, gentlemen, oh, no. On the contrary some telephone messages, things that could not be so easily traced or understood. And these so few and brief that she herself complained bitterly of his lack of interest and consideration for her at this time. So much so that at the end of five weeks, growing desperate. She wrote, and here Mason picked from a collection of letters on the table behind him a particular letter, and read. This is to tell you that unless I hear from you either by telephone or letter before noon Friday, I will come to lie Kyrgyz and the world will know how you have treated me. Those are the words, gentlemen, that this poor girl was at last compelled to write. But did Clyde Griffiths want the world to know how he had treated her? Of course not. And there and then began to form in his mind a plan by which he could escape exposure and seal Roberta Alden's lips forever. And, gentlemen, the state will prove that he did so close her mouth. At this point Mason produced a map of the Adirondacks which he had had made for the purpose, and on which in red ink were traced the movements of Clyde up to and after her death, up to the time of his arrest at Big Bear. Also, in doing this, he paused to tell the jury of Clyde's well-conceived plan of hiding his identity, the various false registrations, the two hats. Here also he explained that on the train between Fonda and Utica, as again between Utica and Grass Lake, he had not ridden in the same car with Roberta. And then he announced. Don't forget, gentlemen, that although he had previously indicated to Roberta that this was to be their wedding journey, he did not want anybody to know that he was with his prospective bride, no, not even after they had reached Big Bittern. For he was seeking, not to marry but to find a wilderness in which to snuff out the life of this girl of whom he had tired. But did that prevent him, twenty-four and forty-eight hours before that time, from holding her in his arms and repeating the promises he had no intention of keeping? Did it? I will show you the registers of the two hotels in which they stayed. And where, because of their assumed approaching marriage, they occupied a single room together. Yet the only reason it was 48 instead of 24 hours was that he had made a mistake in regard to the solitude of Grass Lake. Finding it brisk with life. The center of a summer religious colony, he decided to leave and go to Big Bittern, which was more lonely. And so you have the astounding and bitter spectacle. Gentlemen, of a supposedly innocent and highly misunderstood young man dragging this weary and heartsick girl from place to place, in order to find a lake deserted enough in which to drown her and with her but four months from motherhood. And then, having arrived at last at one lake lonely enough, putting her in a boat and taking her out from the inn where he had again falsely registered as Mr. Clifford Golden and wife, to her death. The poor little thing imagined that she was going for a brief outing before that marriage of which he talked and which was to seal and sanctify it. To seal and sanctify it. To seal and sanctify, as closing water seal and sanctify, but in no other way, no other way. And with him walking whole and sly, as a wolf from its skill, to freedom, to marriage, to social and material and affectionate bliss and superiority and ease, while she slept still and nameless in her watery grave. But, oh, gentlemen, the ways of nature, or of God, and the providence that shapes our ends, rough-hew them how we may. It is man who proposes, but God, God, who disposes. The defendant is still wondering, I am sure as to how I know that she thought she was still going to be married after leaving the inn at Big Bittern. And I have no doubt that he still has some comforting thoughts to the effect that I cannot really and truly know it. But how shrewd and deep must be that mind that would foresee and forestall all the accidents and chances of life. For, as he sits there now, secure in the faith that his counsel may be able to extract him safely from this, and at this Clyde sat bolt upright, his hair tingling. And his hands concealed beneath the table, trembling slightly. He does not know that that girl, while in her room in the Grass Lake Inn, had written her mother a letter. Which she had not had time to mail, and which was in the pocket of her coat left behind because of the heat of the day. And because she imagined she was coming back, of course. And which is here now upon this table. 
At this Clyde's teeth fairly chattered. He shook as with a chill. To be sure, she had left her coat behind. And Belknap and Jeffson also sat up, wondering what this could be. How fatally, if at all. Could it mar or make impossible the plan of defense which they had evolved? They could only wait and see. But in that letter, went on Mason, she tells why she was up there, to be married, no less, and at this point Jeffson and Belknap, as well as Clyde. Heaped an enormous sigh of relief, it was directly in the field of their plan, and within a day or two, continued Mason, thinking still that he was literally riddling Clyde with fear. But Griffiths, or Graham, of Albany, or Syracuse, or anywhere, knew better. He knew he was not coming back. And he took all of his belongings with him in that boat. And all afternoon long, from noon until evening, he searched for a spot on that lonely lake, a spot not easily observed from any point of the shore, as we will show. And as evening fell, he found it. And walking south through the woods afterwards, with a new straw hat upon his head, a clean, dry bag in his hand. He imagined himself to be secure. Clifford Golden was no more. Carl Graham was no more, drowned, at the bottom of Big Bittern, along with Roberta Alden. But Clyde Griffiths was alive and free, and on his way to Twelfth Lake, to the society he so loved. Gentlemen, Clyde Griffiths killed Roberta Alden before he put her in that lake. He beat her on the head and face, and he believed no I saw him. But, as her last death cry rang out over the water of Big Bittern, there was a witness, and before the prosecution has closed its case, that witness will be here to tell you the story. Mason had no eyewitness, but he could not resist this opportunity to throw so disrupting a thought into the opposition camp. And decidedly, the result was all that he expected, and more. For Clyde, who up to this time and particularly since the thunderbolt of the letter, had been seeking to face it all with an imperturbable look of patient innocence, now stiffened and then wilted. A witness. And here to testify. God. Then he whoever he was, lurking on the lone shore of the lake. Had seen the unintended blow, had heard her cries. Had seen that he had not sought to aid her. Had seen him swim to shore and steal away. Maybe had watched him in the woods as he changed his clothes. God! His hands now gripped the sides of the chair. And his head went back with a jerk as if from a powerful blow. For that meant death, his sure execution. God! No hope now. His head dropped and he looked as though he might lapse into a state of coma. As to Belknap, Mason's revelation at first caused him to drop the pencil with which he was making notes. Then next to stare in a puzzled and dumbfounded way. Since they had no evidence wherewith to forfeit against such a smash as this. But as instantly recalling how completely off his guard he must look, recovering. Could it be that Clyde might have been lying to them, after all? That he had killed her intentionally, and before this unseen witness? If so it might be necessary for them to withdraw from such a hopeless and unpopular case, after all. As for Jeffson, he was for the moment stunned and flattened. And through his stern and not easily shakable brain raised such thoughts as, was there really a witness? Has Clyde lied? Then the die was cast. For had he not already admitted to them that he had struck Roberta, and the witness must have seen that? And so the end of any plea of a change of heart. Who would believe that, after such testimony as this? But because of the sheer contentiousness and determination of his nature, he would not permit himself to be completely baffled by this smashing announcement. Instead he turned, and after surveying the flustered and yet self-chastising Belknap and Clyde, commented, I don't believe it. He's lying, I think, or bluffing. At any rate, we'll wait and see. It's a long time between now and our side of the story. Look at all those witnesses there. And we can cross-question them by the week, if we want to until he's out of office. Plenty of time to do a lot of things. Find out about this witness in the meantime. And besides, there's suicide. Or there's the actual thing that happened. We can let Clyde swear to what did happen. A cataleptic trance. No courage to do it. It's not likely anybody can see that at 500 feet. And he smiled grimly. At almost the same time he added, but not for Clyde's ears. We might be able to get him off with 20 years at the worst. Don't you think? End of the chapter. Thank you. Thank you.